like, hurry, hurry, hurry. No, we literally have like two minutes. better so tell me how did you guys first like get involved in ACC like how did it all start for you guys so we were all a uh, bunch of us dads and kids were coaching and playing together and we got together and Tim invited us and said hey some of us are going to show up at harvest on a Sunday and let's see how many people show up and um, for people that are, might be having a hard time getting plugged in in local Argyle churches or whatever it may be and uh, we, we showed up, and we've been here since then. Right? Oh, that's so awesome. Okay, so I know you guys are, like, really plugged in, and you do so many things. So will you just tell us a few of, like, the areas that, that you guys are involved in and leading in our church? Yes. So um, I lead our corporate prayer. That's um, where we come together as a church on Sunday mornings at 930. It's for 15 minutes, and we just uh, get to and then also I'm involved with our children's uh, department and so I help teach with three-year-olds and then also I've been doing a fifth grade uh, Bible study and then um, my husband is kind of in charge of our men's ministry that uh, we also do here. Yeah, Rick does men's breakfast and the fishing trip that's coming up so if you're signed up for that you're going to get to know Rick really well. Yep. So one of the ways that you guys are you know leading this summer is that you're going to be leading a group and it's not just the summer it's for two semesters it's summer and fall so tell us about your group. So it's a 12-week study um, and since the sem summer is a little bit shorter than the fall of the right. semester we're going to divide it into two semesters. So there'll be five lessons that we cover in the summer, S seven, seven in the <laughs> my fall. math, yeah. um, seven in the fall. And so it, the summer will be a really good mix of socials and also studying God's word. But the study that we're doing really excited about is the is book of Daniel and the yeah. prophecies in Daniel 
and how they apply today because prophecy still applies and and the history of the prophecy and what has come true and 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 where we're going to be going um so we're really excited about it's going to be awesome okay so if you um if you're thinking okay that's something i might be interested in what is like is it like book led is it a video like so it'll be uh We'll send a link. There's a booklet to download, okay. um, and so or, or we'll, we may do that for them um, and, and print them out. But then also there's a link in a video that, that we'll be watching. It's maybe a 20 minute, 25 minute video, okay. and then discussion questions afterwards. Okay. And it is on Thursday nights. Okay. Seven to eight thirty. Okay. Thursday nights. Um, for the teaching, and then our socials will be Friday nights. Okay. Oh, fun. Okay, great. So I love that you guys are doing some socials too because. I think summertime, a lot of people travel, and and also, it's just this like time to like get together and hang out with friends. So I'm so glad you guys are doing that too. Um, so um, if people want to get involved in this group, the best way for them to, to get signed up is to go to our website, which is argylecommunitychurch.com, and you can go to the group, the group likes link, and you'll see all of our groups there. But if you want to do this study, you can just click on their face, and sign up and it's super super easy so yeah well um do you want to tell us a little bit more about um some other things you guys are involved in uh tell us about the fishing trip because i know that's coming up and just have oh my gosh two weeks two weeks weeks. two weeks we have a a father-son fishing trip that we plan we're taking 52 people to lake texoma on a guided fishing trip it's it's a great mix of people who are part of our church, people who are sometimes part of our church, and some people who've never been to our church before, and that's okay. what we want. Yeah. Part of Argyle Community Church is to reach the community, and so um, we'll be we'll be fishing in the morning. We're going to be on the lake about 6 o'clock, then we're going to drive back, and then we're going to do a huge fish fry for probably 50 or 60 people uh, oh, uh, afterwards. Oh, that's so and awesome. And so we're really looking forward to that. Man, that is going to be fantastic. You guys have done a great job finding stuff for the boys to do, her father-son stuff, and I know the men's breakfast is, gosh, you had like over 25 people there this past Tuesday, right? We're averaging about 25 people a week. Again, it's a mix of people who right. are the church and not, so that's great. That's what we want. Yeah, so, and community. you know, if, if you're a man watching and you're like, breakfast, yes, you know, four. Second Tuesday of the month. Second Tuesday of each month at six, from 6.30 to 7.30 a.m. Yeah. They open just for us. So we have the whole place to ourselves. Man, that is fantastic. And I know that you speak sometimes, and then sometimes there's other people the who guest talk. guest speakers a lot. Okay. And so Chad spe- spoke, yes, Adam my Brown, husband Tim has- spoke. So, so, um, so, yeah, so the whole point is just to encourage men, challenge men, because right? we do need to be challenged today. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Um, and then also uh, then to encourage them again. Uh, that they're not alone, and, and we're not going through all this alone. Yeah, So for God sure. has us. That's awesome. And will you tell us a little bit more about corporate prayer? What time is it? Like, if somebody was like, oh, I love I love corporate prayer. Like, let's do that. Where would they join you at? So we do corporate prayer at 930. It's about, we do it for about 15 minutes because we do our service right after that. And it's really just a time for anyone who wants to come the kids come in yes. and they say the sweetest prayer and um, if it's intimidating I have uh, topics that people can take and pray for those things for the church it really creates a unity that we're all kind of uh, doing this together and uh, working together for the good of the church and, and God's glory um, but really I just want people to come and just pray what's on their heart and so um, it's been a great experience uh, we've seen a lot of and um, we would love for you guys to come. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me. I, I can take your mic. Thank you for joining me and like, just telling us about your group. We hope that it's going to be awesome and fill up. So, okay, awesome. So, um, you guys. Um, so we're done? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're oh. You guys, You guys, I'm going to dismiss you. Thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. Yes, for sure. So um, I have a few more things that I want to tell you guys about this morning. But first, let's pan out and just look at everybody who's coming into church today. We have everyone's filling in. There's people back there. I know that a lot of times we say, make sure to bring your lawn chair. But we have a ton of chairs that we've purchased. 
and we are filling up every single week. So if you're still like, maybe I should bring my lawn chair, maybe I shouldn't. Yes, bring your lawn chair because um, we will. We can move some of these around and make sure that you get to sit right where you want to. So uh, we are so excited that every Sunday we, we just see more and more new faces. We love seeing new faces and we definitely want those people to be able to get plugged in. And so the best way for you to do that is to join a group. Uh, we have three groups this summer. Uh, you just met the Gailies and they're, they're doing the, uh, the Daniel study, which is gonna be fantastic. And then, um, and then uh, another group that we have this summer is the Reeds group. The Reeds are doing um, like a poolside fellowship this summer. So it's gonna be super casual and easy for everybody to um, just get to know each other. The kids are gonna swim, you can bring some food. It's gonna be very casual and uh, just a time of fellowship. And then we also have um, the Zamzals group and they are doing um, a study on by Francis Chan. It's a marriage study. So if you'd like to join those, you can text GROUPS to 817-406-9822. Thank you so much for watching and we'll have church in just a few moments. Ladies and gentlemen, go ahead and let's rise and let's celebrate the king this morning.
Yeah, there we go. All right, you guys can have a seat. Um, my name is Jen Hill, and I want to introduce you guys to a special family this morning. Um, this is Rick and Ann Gailey, and uh, they are going to be leading a group this summer. You guys know I'm all about that. So I just want to give them an opportunity to tell you about their group. I may not need that one. I don't know. Um, but uh, we are leading a group. It's actually going to be two semesters. It's over the book of Daniel. And so it's a 12-week study. But since the summer's so short, we're going to go five weeks in the summer and seven weeks in the fall. So um, we're going to have a lot of fellowships this summer, get to know each other. So, um, But the book of Daniel is on the prophecies in, in Daniel and, and what has come true and where we're going with it. So... Um, you guys, if, if that's something you're interested in doing, we'd love to have you in our group. Um, I just want to clarify that um, it sounds like a huge commitment, but if this is just you're signing up for this uh, summer, and then what you do in the fall is up to you. <laughs> we will judge you if you don't stay in it, though. Oh, it's going to be on Thursday nights from 7 to 8.30. Um, the actual study will be 7 to, to 8.30 on Thursday nights and then fellowships on Friday nights because it's a lot more fun to do fellowships on Fridays than it yeah. is Thursdays. No work on Saturdays for most of us. So, thank anyone you else? Guys. Yeah, thank you guys so much. And um, I'm going to do something really unorthodox for church. Get ready. I want everybody to take out their cell phones. Go on. Get them out. No, you have. Yes, we know you have them. Go ahead and put them on silent but that's not what we're doing. <laughs> so everybody, um, take out your phones, go to your uh, your text messages, and I want you to text the word groups to 817-406-9822. And when you do that, it's gonna pull up the link from our website with all of our groups right there on your phone. So easy. So that way everybody has it, and uh, you can use that anytime. So um, we are going to continue with worship. Thanks for listening to my good friends, Rick and Ann. Oh, did you want to add something? Yeah, group. Do the text. All right, y'all can go ahead and stand up, and um, we are going to continue with worship. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout.
shall fill my heart, then I shall bow in humble adoration, and then proclaim
sit down yet, I want you guys to introduce yourselves to each other and just take a moment to shake the hand of the person next to you. Um, I know we have a lot of guests to here today. I know we have a lot of parents visiting. So make sure to introduce them to your friends. And I know we've got a lot of friends and neighbors here today. Introduce them to the people around you. We are so glad you guys are all here today. God is good. We are so glad to get to stand together and worship together. with us today. Man, we are so excited to have you here today. We love that you're visiting our church and we really want to get to know you. So um, if you are a guest today, please just raise your hand. This is your moment. Um, we have an usher who is going to, thank you, sir. We have an usher who is going to bring a form over to you. And then you can just take it over here where it says get connected after service. And I'll have a special gift for you. And I look forward to meeting you. So I have a few quick announcements for you. First of all, child dedication is coming up. That is next Sunday. So if you have a child that is six years old or younger, this uh, child dedication class is an online class. You can uh, register for it on our website. You can do the class um, on your time. And then next week we will be dedicating um, your children. So that's very exciting. Exciting. Uh, we have three camps that we want you all to know about coming up this summer. Uh, Camp Recharge is almost full. There's a sense of urgency there, guys. Um, definitely want to get your kids signed up for that one. We have the high school camp coming up at Alasso, and then just the following a few days, there's the middle school camp at Alasso. So you can get all of the details for that at our website, argylecommunitychurch.com, and you can get, get your kids registered there too. All right. Thank you so much for uh, listening. This Armed Forces Day this week, and we'd like for you, if you served in any of our armed forces, would you just stand? We want to give you a thank you from our church, from our country, our nation. Guys, we're thankful for you. Ladies, we're thankful for you. Thank you for what you did. Be brave. Be true. God bless you. We are so grateful today. We never want to forget those moments. We're, we're very intentional about that today. Um, Luke chapter 11, verse 13 says, If you then be evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. Now, the word evil sounds a little bad, right? We don't want to be evil. It's just really a word that means sinful, that we have a sinful nature. Anybody in here would be honest and say that uh, maybe like me, you have potential to have once in a while, maybe at some point in your life, you have sinned. Anyone? Okay, cool. So that's what it's saying is that, that we have a sinful nature and we desire good gifts for our children. Now, you guys are great gift givers. I see some of the stuff your kids get, virtual reality. I mean, you guys really step it up. It's pretty amazing. Uh, but here's what it says. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so I just want you to know that God has been gracious to us, generous to us, has provided everything we need. Would you agree with that? And so these are just moments where we get a chance to return. Be praying for us. Here's some things we're praying for for the property. Uh, I'd love to see some horizontal work at some point. So we're working. We're very close to, to finishing some of our initial um, kind of visuals of what we've been, we've been discussing about this. Um, but but materials are getting hard to get. It's getting really weird. Uh, those that are in that business, it's really been hard. And so we just want you to pray that God will just miraculously direct us and show us or our leaders uh, what we should do, when we should do it. I think timing you know matters at the moment. Um, so just be praying for us that way, and then praying for us as we reduce the uh, debt on the property. That's a beautiful piece of property. It's worth a lot. We still owe about seven hundred eighty thousand on all the dirt total. It's almost sixteen acres on three seventy seven. So. Um, anyway, pray for those things. Today, as, as, uh, as givers, we just try to remind us of these things. We always give first. If we give last, we end up just tipping God. And so that's a discipline. Whatever that number is, we really want to give first. Give on purpose, not grudgingly and not forced. Those are just scriptures out of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So uh, just reminders today as we prepare to give. If you want to do that, you can text any amount to 84321. Or you can go to the website and participate. Um, and that's cool. And that is between you and God because we don't know how to track you. All right. That's just you and Jesus. Uh, so whatever the Lord lays on your heart today is a blessing. That, that's awesome. All right, Kay, you got, a, you got a microphone ready? Okay. Let's see. Well, there may be another one. That's muted. Try that. Hello. All right. So Kate is uh, no pressure. We are live. All three people that watch us in Argyle are tuned in right now. And so I want you to not feel too much pressure. Kate's going to pray and receive God's tithes and offerings. We're going to have a little bumper video, meet a couple of new families. Well, some families have been here a while, actually. 
uh, but we're going to celebrate some families and just share some of their story today and then get into the message on Exodus, going back to the Old Testament for the next number of weeks. So, ready to pray? All right, get it, kiddo. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day that we get to gather here underneath um, this uh, roof. Uh, thank you for all that you have done for this church, and just thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning we're going to get into Exodus. We're going to begin our conversation on the call of Moses. I think that'll be great in chapter three. But before we do that, I want to introduce you to a couple of families. We're going to start with the Weirich family. So uh, if you guys would, I think maybe someone will tell us a little bit about yourselves. You can say what you do, don't do. It's up to you, maybe about the kiddos. But uh, just introduce yourself so everybody knows who you all are. Uh, good morning. It's obviously you picked us because you know it's going to be low attendance today with the weather. Just saying. <laughs> so uh, my name is Mike Weirich. This is my wife. Becky Wire. We will have been married this summer, 20 years. Uh, our kids, we have a son who's in ninth grade. His name is Luke. He goes to Argyle High School. We have a daughter named Dylan. She is 12. She's in sixth grade. She goes to Argyle Middle School. Uh, we have been coming to Argyle Community Church since around November of last year. We found out about Argyle Community Church uh, from a just a from Facebook, honestly, had a friend who was attending church here, and we were in, uh, we've been in Argyle for about two and a half years, and we'd been looking for a home, and just randomly saw that posting on Facebook, and we were like, you know, we haven't given this place a chance, let's go. And so we went, and we've never left. We've been here. It was it was something that we felt that was, uh, God was pulling us here as, as a couple, as a family, but also for our kids, and uh, we've just, we've really felt what the church, the name is, the community. And that has been an absolute uh, blessing in our lives. We've been able to serve in various ways. Uh, I've been doing the discipleship with uh, Tim once a week on Wednesday mornings. Uh, I've, been, I've been a part of the setup and teardown crew. Our kids are volunteering once a month. They've been active in the youth group. Uh, Becky, she just kind of coordinates all of us, you know, with all that stuff. Uh, and we've been in a small group, and it's been amazing. We've been able to make some really good connections with families. And I look out today, and I see some of those. I mean, I see the Reeds, I see the Spees, uh, the, the Millers, and a couple other uh, There's Craig right there, him and his wife. So we've, it's been a great experience for us uh, as we move forward. And I'll let Becky tell you. She's the coordinator and the ambassador of fun for our family, so I'll let her tell you what all we do. So... We're very active. We are. We divide and conquer. We play zone defense because we've got two, and so um, he's the pole vaulter. He takes the kids to pole vault, and I go soccer mom. And we travel in the summers. We try to hit all the baseball stadiums across America, and so um, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do this summer. But we do boating too, like Carrie and Jeremy, and so we're just busy, busy, like I'm sure all of you are. But. We forgot that part. I like it. Sorry. Um, so I, God has really blessed us with the church, and I think we were at a point in our lives where we really needed our kids to be poured into and our lives to be poured into. And so coming here and all the ladies that I have met, and we braved the rain in Waco, and we, you know, I'm doing a Bible study too with um, Amy and Mandy, and it's just been a real blessing to our family. Our kids are being able to be poured into by Whitney and Landry, and 
um, I can I can see God moving in our home, and and it's been a real blessing. So. Love it, love it. Thank God for them, guys. We love you. Appreciate you. Awesome. All right. So Dustin's coming. Trace's got to get. Uh, she's got to stop working for a second. And come over here. Dustin, I need you to put something to rest for us because we hear a lot of thanks, man. Here you go. Um, these are our questions. I like it. Keep me on track. So uh, there, there's a huge controversy in Argyle anyway, I mean, as a whole. Is it Mobley or Mobley? Because dadgummit, I'm tired of trying to guess at this, right? I think it's Mobley. Any Mobleys? Anybody think this is Mobley? Any Mobleys? See, this is a serious issue. I need you to clear this up for us. So the Mobley Mobley family, go for it. Okay. Well, I need a drum roll. Hello. <laughs> so Mobley was a... Uh, Go, what was that uh, Jungle Book character? So it's Mobley. Yeah, there you go. Let's leave it at that. Officially Mobley. All right, would you welcome the Mobley family? The Mobley family, yes. I love it. All right, man, so I'll ask you these questions so we're really official. Uh, tell us about your family, your kids, your names, schools, that kind of thing, grades. Well, my name's Dustin. This is my wife, Tracy. We are the Mobleys. Uh, be married 21 years this year. Um, we have been in this church for, what, one and a half years? February of 20. Yeah, February of 20. What? We're live, so just bring her on up to the chin. Here? There you go. Better? Awesome. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so we have two kids, uh, my son, 12, uh, no, 13 now, golly, he's 13 years old, Cade, middle school, and uh, daughter, nine, Savannah. She goes to a Hilltop, so... Awesome. All right, how'd y'all find out about ACC? Uh, the Loftuses. Hmm. Phil Loftus actually invited Thanks, us. Uh, we were, it was a funny story. So I was looking at buying a car. and Surprise. I, <laughs> Phil, Phil had the, the vehicle I was looking at, and I was like, hey, man, can I drive it? He's like, absolutely. So and he asked me what we were doing. I was like, well, we're getting ready to go to church. He said, you should try out ACC. It's right <laughs> down the road. And I said, okay. And uh, we haven't left. So. Nice. That's awesome. Dustin's a car guy. So what are some things your family enjoys doing? Obviously, uh, cars, working on cars, buying cars, selling cars. He's yes. a car guy. Yes. I just know if it goes fast or if it's loud. So whenever he's telling me about cars, I ask oh. him those two questions. Is it this, fast this or is, is it loud? Super, <laughs> this is super unfair to him, Chase. But um, <laughs> when we did our discipleship with Dustin, we had like a time where it says, you know, maybe share, just confess some things that you're working through in your life, whatever. So all these, we're all sharing sin, and it's all guys, and you're like, oh, here we go. Gets to Dustin, he's like, I love cars, man. <laughs> I love cars. Like, Always. This is a problem. All right, go ahead. Always. So as a family, what we enjoy doing, we love going out to Possum Kingdom. My, our in-laws, his parents have a place out there, so we love going to the lake. Uh, just being in nature and just the trees and the water, it's just so relaxing, and that's what we like to do during the summer. We, uh, when we're at home, we love playing board games. Sequence, we love sequence. The kids have really gotten into that one, so we love that. Um, as far as what God's do doing in our lives, I believe that he's really given both of us a servant's heart. That's our mm -hmm. gift. And he placed a family on our street. They were renting a house um, a few years ago. They've moved, and their son was diagnosed with leukemia. So we have been blessed just to be able to walk alongside them they moved here from Germany, and they're actually moving back to Germany at the end of this month. So we're happy for them. They haven't seen family due to COVID in a while, and they're so happy to get back there. But he's still in active treatment, and we're hoping that they get to come to the church and share their story because many of y'all might know them. They have a daughter at West, and then their son, Daniel Raymond, he goes to the middle school. And he actually just got the math award for their class. And uh, he didn't really even know that he got the award. So our son Cade texted him and was like, hey, did you know you got the award for seventh grade math? And he texted him back, no. So anyhow, um, that's mm -hmm. just been a family that's been on our hearts. And so many people here in the community have really poured out to them through uh, financially, through meals, and just when they needed to move um, abruptly to a new house. There were so many people that just during COVID that provided a way for them to be able to have movers so they didn't have to do that while going back and forth to Children's Hospital. So that's our story. I love it. Selfless plug here. Yeah. If 
if you have heard about it, we do this thing called discipleship here at ACC. If you haven't been a part of it, please do. It is the most gratifying, self-gratifying thing you'll do until you do it with someone else. And then you'll understand what it's about. So if you haven't gotten involved with that, please do. Right on, bud. Thank you for that. All right, let's thank them, the Mobley family. <laughs> All right, well, let's get right to work here this morning. Um, when we start our second service, we will have something called Growth Track, and it'll be a little more official for how to partner with ACC. So right now, we're just wanting to meet people to see what God's doing in their lives, and this has been a great way to do it. So we're going to be in Exodus for a little bit. Today, we're going to jump in and give you a little history of the Old Testament, a little bit of history of the book of Exodus. Uh, then we're going to get to Exodus chapter 3. We'll try to get that done uh, in the next 30 minutes, all right? So um, people say, Tim, why the Old Testament? I thought we were done, you know, after Haggai, bro. <laughs> Anybody do the Haggai thing and you thought, what is this going to be about? But we got great takeaways from it. We learned a lot about what God prioritizes. So that meant a lot to me, a whole lot to me, how God spoke to us through that. But we are in the Old Testament again because I think it's very relevant. I think it's incredibly relevant. Now, there are things we don't calculate about the Old Testament. We sometimes forget, but they're, they're a big deal. All right, so there are things that we would take for granted. This is in Leviticus 18. These are laws on moral relationships. Look, look at how specific this is, right? None of you shall approach any of his near relatives to have relations. I am the Lord. You shall not have relations with your father or have relations with your mother. She is your mother. You shall not have relations with her, right? So that seems like a, what a wild text, right? But here's the thing. In Cana, the Canaanites, or the Amalekites or the Hittites, they did not, they did practice this way. And so God knew these were going to be things that would bring pain. Maybe that was emotional pain. Maybe that was some other consequence. And as much of a no does as that seems, do you know that the moral laws of, of relationships like that in the Bible, all but two of these laws are legislated globally around the world? Where do they get that sense of morality? Where do they get the sense of right and wrong? It actually came from the scripture and so this is a, a pretty big deal now this comes from the first books of your Bible and they are wild books okay if you hadn't read these holy cow there's no movies that can really kind of compare I mean this is wild stuff but you hear this fancy word anybody know what that word is the Torah the Torah so this is a very well-known uh, you know document uh, that has Genesis Exodus Leviticus numbers and Deuteronomy and so this is adhered to by other religions, other faiths, including uh, the first five books for the Muslims as well. And so this is a shared text. Guys, this is ringing. If anybody's back there, please help me out. It's too hot. So the Torah is the word for law, and that's really what it means. But there are other words for it. Okay, the Pentateuch is one word for it. Um, there are other words you may have heard, like the books of Moses or the books of the law of Moses, or people refer to it as the Law and the Prophets, but essentially all of those words really mean the word up top. So if you hear any of those terms, that, that's speaking of the Torah. The Torah is read and memorized, uh, incredibly important documents in, in Judaism and Orthodox Judaism. And we usually know Exodus for one thing. We know it for some commandments. So how many commandments are there? How many? That's right. Not ten, actually. I set you up. In the Torah, there's actually 613 commandments. So we've got 10 that were inscribed on stone, and those are very well known, and clearly that set out morality in many ways. We knew not to kill and steal and, you know, lie and covet and, you know, all, you know, commit murder, all these kind of things. We knew to keep the Sabbath holy and honor our father and mother, and so we got these commandments, but there's a bunch of commandments, so I think a lot of the Old Testament actually belongs today. And Exodus is really a lot of our story. Hey, it's these people that were in Egypt that were enslaved and they came out of slavery following God and, uh, and they were set free. In a lot of ways, it's, it's kind of God removing us from lives of sin, that we are slaves of sin. Paul says we no longer have to be slaves to sin in Romans 6. And so a lot of Israel's story here is really our spiritual story as spiritual Jews in a lot of ways. There's hundreds of individual laws in the Torah, but they really boil down to this, you know, that we should love God. Uh, God established himself as, as the God over Israel in Exodus, and also that we should have love and respect for others. And that was not common or commonly practiced. And that's why extreme passages like in Leviticus that we read were because really life was not valued and there was not a lot of respect for people. So when it came to love and devotion for God, 
there was a big deal because God didn't want his chosen people to worship other gods, and that's what was happening around Israel. And so God established himself as Israel's God as you get through this book of Exodus, and you'll see that he creates a tabernacle with the Ark of the Covenant. His presence is there, and he established himself as the, himself as the one true God. When it comes to love and respect for others, they were expected to show generosity to marginalized people, execute justice for both the rich and the poor, and these were not common thoughts in the Old Testament. If you read the Old Testament, you will see this is not a common thing to, to, to take care of the orphan, the widow, and the poor, or marginalized people. It is barbaric and very conquering, and that's really the, the idea through a lot of the text. So if you think about this story in Exodus, this is wild, okay? We're getting ready to read it from the Bible here, that Moses goes and leads these people out. But when he leads them out, we know the number of men. So by the time we had women and children... And others, the total count, probably around two and a half million people that are enslaved in Egypt. And Moses says, hey, we're going to get out of here. We're going to make a big, you know, the, the world's largest jailbreak. And we're going to head out and we're going to have to cross this sea because Moses had crossed it before, but, but not on dry land. And he's going to lead them out of this. But I want you to think about how crazy it is. You know, some of the Bible is difficult for us, I know, because we have to think about taking some things that are hard to take by faith. I looked up how much average food a person consumes in America. Uh, the average is three to five pounds of food per day. So if you're over that, um, you're excelling, man. I just want to tell you that. Okay. Uh, but if you're, if, you're, if you're under that, when I said that, my wife was like, we don't eat four pounds of food a day? And I was like, I don't know, I think I had a half pound burger and I probably ordered a full pound at Bumber Shoots or some sort of barbecue by the time I throw in the, anyway, that'll help me. Um, it's not really a good time for me to confess this. So two and a half million people at four pounds of food that God is miraculously providing for. Think about this. Ten million pounds of food a day has to be given out. So God is, through quail and manna, providing miraculously for his people. Well, let's go ahead and get Moses' story. Now, I'm just the kind of guy that if there's a really difficult thing in the Bible that's in the Old Testament, I have to grasp it. Uh, in layman's terms. That's just the way my brain works. Is there anybody in here simple as me? Okay, so maybe this will help you. If you forgot, here's a refresher on Moses' story. Moses is born. Okay, that's a good place to start. Moses is born, and when he's born uh, and he starts to grow up, there's a guy in the land named Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, I got a problem. There's a whole bunch of Israelites, and there's going to be way too many of them, and eventually they're going to turn on us, and if we're going to enslave them and get them to behave and do what we need them to do, we have to be cautious with how populated they're getting. And he decides, I'm going to go ahead and just kill all of these babies. And so he starts to kill these baby boys in the land. And Moses had a brother and sister, Miriam and Aaron. And so he ends up having this sister. And they decide, let's try to get uh, protect Moses. Because really, they knew, his parents knew that, that there was something special about him. So they make like a basket and they put him in a river. Now, this river... Uh, it, it is like the river Nile and I know that the, I don't know where all the crocodiles live in the world But I thought man who knows what what he braved being in the river floating down the river I mean if, if you had a baby and you put him in a basket and you put him in the river I mean your chances aren't great things are gonna work out. Okay, but look at how God intervenes as he goes down the river a girl finds him Well, you know who that girl is That's the girl whose dad is trying to murder all the babies. Okay, see how simple I try to make this because it's how I understand um so it's Pharaoh's daughter, the guy who's trying to kill all the babies. It's his girl that finds him. And she's like, does that thing that your kids do when they find a, a kitten, right? Can we keep it? Can we keep it? Can we keep it? And so she's like, we like it. Can we? And so anyway, he ends up, his life is rescued by Pharaoh's daughter. Now Pharaoh ends up just like you, where you're like, we're not having it. Okay, it's cute. Right? And so Pharaoh's like, I like him. And then he grows up and he trains him and he puts him on the Pharaoh team. But he's not a Pharaoh guy. He's not an Egyptian. He's a... Hebrew. He's an Israelite. And so now here's Moses. Uh, he's, he's basically working for the guy who was going to try to kill all of his contemporaries and has now enslaved his own people. And this is becoming really difficult. And Moses sees the abuse of his own people and loses his mind, loses his temper. And he just eventually just murders this guy. So now Moses is a murderer. And he has now really done something that the Pharaoh team is not, not going to be able to tolerate. So they decide they're after him. Well, what does he do? He runs to the desert, the same place he's trying to get these people out now. Years later, he runs there. He goes to Midian. He goes, he's a shepherd, and he crosses that sea that, remember the Red Sea that parted? He had to do that the first time without any of, the, uh, of his Hebrew team. So he just gets over there, and he's a shepherd. 
And that's what he ends up doing. He runs away as a murderer. He's, he's kind of off the grid. He's in hiding. Now, the first, when this happened, when he murdered somebody, he was 40 years old. So I am not 40 years old. I am more than 40 years old. And he was 40 when this happened, takes off, and then he's a shepherd. You know how many more years he's a shepherd? 40. There's a real theme in the Bible, so you can do biblical numerology and find out why. There's lots of reasons for this. Matter of fact, when Jesus was born, they're trying to kill babies, he went to Egypt. The Bible says, out of Egypt, I love my son. And Matthew, you can see that in chapter 2. It's like, it's incredible. There's all of this, this incredible prophecy through here. This is really about Christ, but and, and, and our, our story of redemption through Christ from, for salvation. But in the end, this particular practical story, he runs away as a murderer. He leaves Egypt, and he lives in this land where he's off the grid. And he does it for 40 years. Now, I want you to do this with me. Ready? 40 plus 40. If you went to public school, you're still good. All right? 40 plus 40, 80. He's 80 years old. I'm pretty sure he was like, I'm in retirement. Right? I made it. I've got 40 years. I've been on the run. I'm good. They don't know, no one's even thinking about me anymore, the guy I murdered anymore, no one's after me. He's 80 years old when this happens, and then he sees this tree that's on fire, a bush, as you might know it, this burning bush, and he's like, that's weird. And then he goes to walk, and he's like, I should go check that out. The Bible says he, he tells himself as he's leaving, like, I should really see what that was about. And he goes back to it, and then that tree tells him, I'm actually God, gives him his personal name, Yahweh, it's so holy. It's the way God personally introduced himself to Moses that, that Israel will not write the word Yahweh. It's, they write it without the vowels so that it's, they're never actually spelling his full name because they just revere that so much. So he introduces himself, God does, as a burning fire and, and that he's I am. And he tells Moses, you can do this. Go back to Egypt. And Moses is like, I don't want to go back because I've been 40 years without them finding out I'm here and I'm a murderer. I don't. I mean, I don't, I don't need to open that chapter again. God says, no, I have a job for you to do. He goes, I'm 80. I'm, I'm, I'm retired. Like, I, 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 things are good for me. No, I need you to go back. Well, I don't speak good. Well, I still need you to go back. Moses agrees. He goes back, and he gets the band back together. It's the only way I know how to say that. So he gets all the Hebrews and Israelites together, and he leads his team now out of Egypt. It took a lot of coercing. It took some plagues. But he leads them out of Egypt. He comes back to that sea, but this time he needs a miracle because there's millions of people, right? And all of a sudden, this sea is parted. They get across. Sea closes, kills all the Egyptians. They are safe, and they are in this promise, uh, or in this wilderness, preparing to go into the promised land. Now, how many years were they in the wilderness? Forty. <laughs> Forty more. Pretty wild. All right, you're seeing the pattern. So they spend a lot of years in the desert, and then he did some things that God was like, that's actually not what I wanted you to do. So your punishment is when you get done with this, you're going to die before you get into that promised land. And there is the whole kind of story of Exodus. Not bad? Okay. All right. Good. Three of you. Here we go. Exodus chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Let's read the biblical text now instead of my, my, my simplistic version, and you'll catch this calling, specifically the calling of Moses. Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock west side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, which means a desolate place. That's the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. So he sees this flame, and the bush isn't actually burning down, and that gets his attention. Now, I want you to think, you hear this a lot in the Bible, right? This is from Hebrews which is why men should make coffee, right? Because the Bible says he brews. No, that's bad. Um, that, that, that everybody, come on, that was good. That just came to me, right? Whatever, you guys are ridiculous. Hebrews 12 says, for our God is a consuming fire, right? So you see this representing the purity and the holiness of God. You see him represented by fire often. And they said in Luke 24, 32, when, when they saw Jesus on the road, remember, w w when they were walking, they said, were our hearts not burning within us when he spoke to us? There's just something purifying and powerful about God as a consuming fire. And then even later in Exodus, you see how God led his people as a pillar of cloud, and then what? As a pillar of fire by night. So God shows up and he demonstrates himself and speaks of himself, and we know him in a holy way, that there's this refining fire, this pure fire so Moses essentially sees this bush it is on fire but the bush is not consumed and he says 
I must turn aside and see this marvelous sight. I don't know. I don't know which one you would have done. If you would have been like, that's that's kind of wild. I think I'm out of here. Anybody that's more of your bent? Anybody's curious? Like, no, I would have been the one going. I'm going to check this out. That's why. So he sees it and he and he's like, I, I need to go find out what that is. He goes over there, and then he says, why this bush is not being burned up? Now people think that this may be a representative of of you and I, of Israel, uh, and spiritual Israel because. We're consumed by God's refining fire, but not destroyed. And so that's a lot of people will take that, that from this text as well. So he goes to see the bush, and it says, when, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God calls out to him audibly from the middle of that bush that's on fire, and he says, Moses, Moses. Can you imagine? He went over there, like, I'm going to check this out. And all of a sudden the bush goes, Moses. He's like, Moses. And Moses goes, Yep, I'm here. And then look what he says. Don't come close to here. Right? I'm a refining fire. This is a holy moment. I want you to take off your sandals when you come in. So a lot of times when you see people in the Middle East and they go into any kind of temple, worship center, mosque, whatever, they'll take their shoes off. A lot of that comes from this, this moment. A lot of them say, hey, this is holy ground. And so he told them, remove your sandals from your feet. And then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses knew that language. I mean, he knew then, like, whoa, this is the God of the universe. This is the God that we worship. He was very aware. Moses hid his face, and he was afraid then to look at God because they knew, the Bible says, no one can look at God and live. So he was like, you're who? Whoa. Right? Instantly, like, I can't look at you or I'm dead. But he was veiled through this fire. The Bible said that Jesus' flesh was the veil for God because he was God in flesh. And so he was veiled, and it did not kill Moses or consume the bush. But Moses hid his face. He recognized immediately, this is God. This is the God of the universe. He said, God says this, Surely I've seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. I'm aware of their suffering. So what God says there is, um, Hey, man, I know you murdered a guy because you didn't like they were being treated like that. And I actually, I saw that. I saw it really clearly. And, and it, it, it's obvious to me as well. And so God decides to take this action with Moses. He says, I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and bring them up to a land that is spacious, a land with milk and honey. So he says, I, I want to give them reprieve. I want to bring them to a land. We call it as the promised land. You may hear that language. But there's a land that I'm taking them from this place of oppression and slavery to this land. So he said, to the place with the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, and now behold the cries of the sons of Israel have come up to me. So he says, I've heard them crying, wailing, God deliver us, right? I've seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. And then he says, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to bring my people out. Can you imagine what Moses was thinking? The guy that took me in, the guy we were buddies, the guy that found out I'm a Hebrew, and then I committed murder, and I attacked his guys, and he's the most powerful guy in the world, and enslaving our people and he says that's the guy i'm sending you back to moses so you can imagine he had some trepidation right he had some fear immediately i'm sure and then moses says this who am i i love that god says well i am right well who am i well i am who am i i am you just tell them i am sent you is what's getting ready to happen moses feels very unqualified he said i don't think i can bring these people out and then God says, certainly I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it's I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. So here's what's wild. He brought the people out of Egypt, and guess where they went back to? That place where he saw the burning bush. Once all of this transpired, and they were out of slavery, they crossed the Red Sea, they went back to this place. And many believe this is exactly where we got the Ten Commandments, was in that place. Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I'll say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. They're going to say to me, What's his name? What shall I say to them? Here's what Moses says. Moses says, Hey, God, it's been 40 years, and I know they're crying because they're suffering, but I don't know if they know you anymore. Like, they may have taken on the customs of the world. They may not actually know you. Who, what if they don't recognize you? What if I go and say, Hey, God told me to, to get you, and they're like, Who's that? I don't know who he is. What, what's his name? It's been 40 years. And here's what God's reply is. God says to Moses, I am who I am. I don't know that it's snarky, right? But it's kind of a, you really need me to, you, you need me to, to defend myself, right? No, 
I am who I am. I, there's power in the way I am who I am. And this is the word of Yahweh when he says, I am has sent me to you. So he says, if they, if, if they ask you who I am, just let them know, hey, he is who he is. He's exactly who he said he is. You don't, you don't need to, to question that. He's everything you need, everything we need. He's in control. He's going to get us out of here. He's powerful. So Moses goes on this mission. Now, I had some conviction this week because I'm getting ready to summarize just a few points out of this story of Moses today, and, and these are things I hope you can take away. So if you're new to church, you'll find some takeaways here, I promise. And as I wrote these, I, I had made them about you being in the waiting, a time of waiting, and these points were, were kind of you central. And as I prayed and was preparing, I literally heard this voice just say to me, like, you know these stories are about me, right? <laughs> and I was like, yes. Yes, I do. Now, was that audible? No. I would have been dead. You'd have had to raise me from the dead. Um, but, I, but I just had that sense of, like, what, what, what do I need to be doing? Why, why do I feel convicted? And it was like immediately I changed what, what I was saying today and communicating with us because a lot of times, you know, messages are about a better you. We've got to find a takeaway so that you can go out of here with some practical thing. But let me tell you something. The Bible is about him. The story is about him. Your life and your story is still about him. And I felt great conviction this week. And so I just want to be confessional and let you know that as we read these, this was in my mind. I switched all these points on like Thursday and made God the focus. So number one, God uses the waiting. I want you to think about what we read. Moses is in the past. He's pastoring the flock. He probably didn't think God had anything else for him to do. 40 years, he's just being a shepherd on the run off the grid. And in that waiting, God was working something in him. And at 80 years old, God said, hey, I got something for you to do. Now look right here. If someone is 60, 70, 80, a lot of times they think their job is just to buy some grandkids presents and, and, and ride this thing out. You don't know what God's calling you to do. I, I've, I've been putting a lot of uh, zeal into conversation with my own parents who are meeting with people and discipling them because that's been such a passion of my own. But, but I see God renewing things in my parents that are, you know, way further along in, in years. And I don't want them to retire. I don't want them to think, like, God's done with me because, you know, I'm not 20. That's not true. God has things for you to do right now at any age. And there's seasons where we are in the waiting, but God's in that season. Moses was just pastoring the flock when this happens. God decides when to open and close doors because he knows what's on the other side. Maybe you're in, like, a season of the waiting, right? God doesn't open a door, don't be devastated. He knows what's on the other side of that. What if he opened it and you're like, oh, shoot, close that quick. Right? It, it, there aren't unanswered prayers for believers. God's sovereign and in control. And so just trust him. If there's a season of waiting, he's in that. God's timing is worth waiting for. Number two, God uses the unqualified. Here's what Moses said. Who am I? One of the biggest obstacles to us sharing our faith, right, when we go... To work or we live our lives as we go man but who am i i got too many questions about you know this this whole thing anyway i don't live this out very well i got my own issues I, I hear all of that stuff listen if you think anybody comes to you and says you know i don't have issues that person really they need they need to stay in the waiting until god points out to them that they have issues okay as everybody in this room is is on some level unqualified i think the scariest thing to me in the world would be if you came to me and said tim I'm ready to teach the Bible, and I feel super qualified, man. I mean, I, I'm just one of those people in this room that I, I may be overqualified for what God calls me to do, but I did write a book about humility. It's 101 ways you can grow in humility. And uh, Anyway, I've got a banner I'd like to hang up. Uh, here's the thing. Listen, whatever it is, if you feel qualified, then, then hang out for a while. Okay? If you feel unqualified and you recognize that, you and I should be talking. Because I think God may be ready to use your life because humility is a currency. It's a currency. People can, they can connect with that. Leaning on God's wisdom is not weakness. Some people go, well, I just, I don't know enough of the Bible. Listen, if you lean on God's wisdom, we go to the Bible together, we study. That's not weakness. That's not ignorance. That's the beauty of you learning to search God's word. That's part of how this works. Admitting we are unqualified is just one of the things that qualifies us to actually be used, maybe in a healthy way, for God's kingdom work. My shortcomings ensure that I can't take credit for what God's about to do. I'm really thankful when I see something happen and I go, shoot, if God didn't pull that off, I know that wouldn't have worked, right? I mean, isn't that, the, isn't that kind of the takeaway? Isn't that the big idea? If I can pull something off myself, then I'm really not dependent. I'm, I'm independent. I could walk that way in the flesh. It's, it's really beautiful when I look and say, man, I have to lean on God. If this isn't God, it don't work. 
That's the way we are right now about our next building, about growth, about adding staff, about all the things God's called us as a church. It's just if God doesn't do it, it ain't going to happen. And, and we're, we're okay with that. We recognize our dependence on God. He knows. He's in control. Sometimes we feel pressure for that, but he's in control. Number three, God asks us to respond and obey. I don't think it's God's okay with the fact that when we know what he's asked us to do, that we just go, eh, I don't think so. I, I don't think he's, he's, he wants that. I think he is asking us to respond. I think he's asking us to obey. What are some things in your life, if you were to think about it right now, what are some things God may be asking me to do and respond in obedience? If you know what that is, what would keep you from leaving here and doing that? So why don't you think about that for a second? What would keep you, if you knew what God was calling you or asking you to do today in any regard, what would keep you from leaving here and starting to do that thing that he's put on your heart? It may be today that he speaks that to you. Listen, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. Look what Paul said. I love this. My power is perfected in weakness. I'd rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Paul says, I love the parts of me that are weak because those are the ones that really belong entirely to God. That's when his power shows up. Just obey and leave the consequences to God. All right? Well, Tim, what if this doesn't happen? What if that doesn't happen? I'm not saying to be a fool, but guys, there are times where you're not going to predict all of this, but if it's a spiritual step and God's called you to it, trust him. Leave the consequences to him. That's okay. Number four, God uses imperfect. 2 Corinthians 12.10, I am well content with my weakness, Paul says, insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties for Christ's sake. When I am weak, that's actually when I'm strong. That's when I'm strong. This is the problem with all of the, the social side of our world right now is everybody thinks the things that get used are the perfect things, right? The most money, the best looking, the most successful, and that is not the stuff God's impressed with because none of that stuff spends in eternity, none of it. Right? The, the, the Bible says that beauty is fleeting. It runs away from you like a bandit. Think about that. It's, I mean, you're, you're chasing it. You're ch and it's just sprinting away. Sorry. It's running. It's running. Because all those things are temporary. And this is what Paul says. Man, I love when I'm weak because when I realize that, I'm content with it because that's when I'm really, really strong. God accomplishes his perfect will through imperfection. That really happens. This, this is his will. Philippians 2, 13 says he works and he wills according to his good pleasure. Think about that. He works and he wills. The whole thing. We can trust him fully to work things out. And he'll do that without our, our perfection. It's his perfection that makes the difference. We're imperfect, but he still gets it done. Think about how many imperfect people God used in the Bible. All right? Just think about some of those people. Adam and Eve, right? Someone said they ate themselves out of house and home. <laughs> no. um, you've got, you know, Adam's an interesting guy. He, he seems like he has the good story, right? I named the animals. I'm the cool guy. Right? You know, God made her out of me, whatever. And then all of a sudden he gets a chance to stand before God. What's he do? He does whatever sinful thing his wife does. Then he's trying to lie about it, cover it up. And then when God asks him what happened, he's like, it's her. I mean, he wouldn't even take ownership at all. I mean, these are imperfect people. In the Bible, there's lots of them. Noah, man, this guy stands for God. He's the only guy saying we got to stand for God. He gets this boat, gets two of all this stuff. They take off. The thing comes to rest. He gets out. First thing he does, gets drunk, gets naked, brings a curse. That's what Noah does. I mean, this is it's crazy. David he becomes a king, and he's a murderer. He's an adulterer. Peter, the rock, the church is, you know, what he speaks to, to Christ. Christ says, that's what I'm going to build my church on. And then he denies Christ. Same guy. Another sin. Moses, right? Murderer. Runaway. Exile. And then there's you and me. All right? Your story, somewhere in there, we could fill in a blank for us. Here's Tim. This is what my deal is. Dustin, it's just cards. I don't know why. I struggle. I want to confess, confess to you already. All the time. My attitude. I get a bad attitude. Get mad about this, mad about that. I struggle with my focus. Struggle with my motives. Struggle eating four pounds of barbecue a day. <laughs> struggle with my prayer life, my state of mind. God doesn't even scratch the surface. Guys, God uses imperfect people. If I thought he had to have perfect people to do anything, I guarantee you we wouldn't have taken this crazy step this year. God uses imperfect people. That's what he does. 
Number five, we go in God's strength and in His power. Think about who's in you. Think about the power of God that resides in you, that calls you and equips you and uses you for His good. As these guys come back and get ready to lead our closing song, Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, Moses says, Hey, I don't think I can do it. God says, It's not your power. It's my strength and my power. He says, Certainly I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it's I have sent, who have sent you when you bring the people out of Egypt and you worship God at this mountain. I love it. He tells Moses, this is so cool to me. He says, I know you're doubting right now, but you know when it's going to get good, Moses? He says, when exactly what I say is going to happen, happens, and you end up right where you're standing right now, and you turn around and there's millions of people, and I did exactly what I said I was going to do. Because it's my strength and my power and my provision. I know it's going to happen. And so just let go of this. Trust me. And you're going to stand right here one day having done exactly what I've called you to do. Sometimes it just takes a, a, a moment of faith to realize God is going to bring us through. It's his strength. It's his power. It's not our own. It's not our own. That's why he said, man, I am who I am. The Lord knows. He knows when you suffer. He knows when you struggle. I thought that's powerful in verse 7 when he says, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. Nothing goes unseen. He doesn't know that you're, it's not like he misses that you're weak. He's not missing what's going on in your job. He doesn't miss the, 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 the weight of that that you say, man, I don't know if I can get up and go to that job one more day, right? Or if things financially didn't turn around for us, you know, it's going to cost us this. He's not asleep at this. He sees the affliction. He sees the pain. Yeah, but does he see what's happening with my kids? You bet he does. You bet he does. Well, what about my husband? What about my marriage? Like, yeah, he sees it. He sees the affliction. He hears our cry. We're learning to trust him and say, and my story is his story. It's his strength. It's his power. It's really dependence. Go ahead, God. Now, here's how I know God knew everything that happened with Moses. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23, it says, By faith, Moses, it's a chapter on faith, was hidden for three months by his parents. His parents knew something was special about him. So long before he got into this conversation, God had already set him aside as a child. Some of you right now, God is setting you aside for things you don't know yet, but he's, he's preparing. And then one day you're going to have that moment where you, you see and hear and understand, just like Moses did. Oh, you're calling me now. I don't know when that is, but I know that God has it worked out for you. Psalm 139 says, your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. The psalmist says, God knew already. Before there wasn't even a single day, he already had your days worked out. I mean, way before God had you in mind. So today, trade God your weaknesses for his strength, because every life is a story, and every story has a writer pen is in his hands and he's writing that story just trust him. listen every life matters god's not going to let any life in this room not impact the kingdom if you'll be surrendered to him he has what you need he has it he has it at work he has it at home anything that it is he's calling you to he's going to equip you and give you strength moses I mean, we see all the, all the stories. They look amazing, but sometimes we have to break it down and remember. This was a murderer in exile that felt like he couldn't even talk. God used him in such a powerful way in history. He can use our lives too. He can. Would you stand with me and let's just say a prayer today. Ask God to bring the takeaways home from the book of Exodus. Apply them to our lives. Help them to, uh, to help us have a clear understanding of, of his truth. And then we're going to sing just the chorus of this song one more time. It speaks a lot to this truth today. Father, we thank you for this story, this example. We're just kind of brushing up on these things because we can sometimes forget the details of the Old Testament. But in Exodus, uh, this story is so powerful. And this first step that we took today, just learning and being reminded of how much you took a, 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 a man who had zeal for you but felt like he had messed up. And then you called him, and you called him when he didn't expect it, when he didn't know it was coming. You called him late in life, and you gave him something to do, and then you empowered him, and you gave him strength. And Lord, the same way in our weakness, we ask that you would make your power perfect in our lives. Thank you for your word.
thank you for what you speak to us every day as we open it up. It's always rich and alive and profitable and life-changing. Pray that you would bless each one in front of me. Make your face to shine upon them and give them peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's listen or sing along with this chorus now. Close it. sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art let's sing that one more time then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great Bless you all.